weekly seminar organized by the liberal arts department today i am extremely uh, glad and uh, almost privileged to um, invite a very uh, renowned philosopher and neuroscientist professor george northoff uh, professor northoff is a philosopher neuroscientist and psychiatrist who is currently based in ottawa canada um, where he holds the canada research chair for mind brain imaging and neuroethics his research focuses on the relationship between brain and mind in its various facets including neuroscience psychiatry and philosophy professor northoff is one of the leading figures in linking philosophy and neuroscience as well as the founder of the non reductive neurophilosophy things which we will have to be introduced to over the course of this over this talk um but more than that he has authored more than 270 journal articles and 15 books which have been translated into several languages and um, his 2016 uh, publication neurophilosophy and the healthy mind was recently also translated into italian in 2019 um professor northoff does not require an introduction but it's a ritual that we do this um but i would now um hand over the mic virtually to professor uh, no not of who have been very kind to to join us today it's currently 5 am in canada so we are even more grateful that you could do this professor um i'll hand it over to you i'll kind of um i'll go mute and move my camera thank you so much professor yeah thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting and i hope you're all well i we i wish you all good uh, safety and health so let me start with my talk and um i try to cover some of the things um hi let me just see can you see all my slides we just can see your your first slide not not all of them yeah 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 everything will come okay great yeah um so you already see the uh, the title of my talk is really the the program uh, of what i'm uh, goes to the heart of the matter and you see below it is really a tale about how hidden philosophical presuppositions shape our model of brain and mind and how that blocks neuroscience and philosophy and there's also and you will see this as throughout my talk there's also a strong cultural dimension to it when i mean here hidden philosophical presupposition i specifically say western anglo american presuppositions about brain and mind which obviously have also strongly infiltrated your part of the world however as far as i understand in your part of the world there's also a different tradition how to see things and i hope obviously i'm not an expert in that but i hope i can make some of those connections and the key assumption is that these connections are key in understanding the brain mind relationship So let me uh, tell you the outline of my talk. I will first introduce sort of a more philosophical issue, the common currency, a novel approach for linking brain and mind. You see, I forgot the approach there. Then I will bring a very concrete example, uh, the example of self, feature it in spatial temporal dynamics rather than in cognitive dynamics. Then I will come to the. Uh, a key talk t key moment the link between brain and environment i will bring you uh, several examples uh, you see this here down animate inanimate environment trauma culture and uh, one brief hint about how covid is conceived and last i will wrap up about the idea of environment brain relationship or world brain relationship which has both philosophical as well as Uh, neuropsychiatric uh, and neuroscientific as well as psychiatric significance so let me start with the first one the common currency what that is so we in the western world usually like to presuppose what we call the specialness of mind uh, and that goes back to descartes in philosophy who said the mind is different from the body because you cannot observe it in third person perspective it is not spatially extended so false decade however um that has really been translated into our current view of the mind of course you will say no 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 decade we don't do the dualism anymore now we know the mind is the brain yes however that is just 
a difference in degree. Because the principal background assumption remains. The mind is something special compared to the non-mind. So now that has been translated into, uh, there's a special neuronal mechanism for mental features. Yeah? So there's a special neuronal mechanism within the brain, which is specifically in charge of mental uh, features, as distinguished from all those neuronal mechanisms, which are not related to mental features. So you have the assumption of specialness carried over from mind uh, to the brain. And you can literally see this in the current neuroscientific research. Uh, I give you an example of the current debate of consciousness. So there's, of course, here is a big block of non-consciousness in philosophy. Psychology is often the unconscious processing. And in neuroscience, if you want to say so, the theory of the brain, one of the leading theories is the predictive coding, free energy by Carl Fritz. So that's all about unconsciousness. That's a non-special. And there's no, philosophically speaking, no necessary relation to mental features. Then there's a special part that has been somehow split up into reflective, higher order thought theories and phenomenal consciousness in philosophy. This is phenomenology, Husserl, Heidegger, and all that tradition. Reflective is more the cognitive, often associated with Kant, uh, reflective consciousness. That has been by net block in philosophy of mind and also permeated strongly psychology. Uh, access consciousness, phenomenal consciousness. If you want to have it more psychologically, you can also speak of implicit and explicit processing. Yeah. Um, and then in neuroscience, in the theories of consciousness, you have the global neuronal workspace theory, uh, targeted small access consciousness, higher order thought theory, uh, recurrent processing theory. And then you have more sort of those theories which are claimed to be the IIT uh, uh, integrated information theory and bottled. But you see, they all rely still on the assumption of specialness that what happens here is principally, and that is important, principally different from what happens here. Yeah? So the specialness versus the non specialness. And oh, let me uh, forward the slides. Yeah, so the difference is here emphasized. Yeah, what is the difference between conscious, unconscious states? Yeah, that's how you test it experimentally. That's what philosophers, the philosophers often uh, don't even think about the non-consciousness because it's in the way it's only the consciousness. Yeah, however, and also if the mind is supposed to be as considered as different, then, of course, you would say, how is the mind related to the body? So, meaning what we call in the Western world the mind body or mind brain problem is a logical consequence of this assumption of specialness, which is often uh, brushed under the carpet or completely ne neglected. It's a hidden presupposition, which is often completely unconscious, actually. Yeah. Yeah, but it's the basis, because if we were not presupposing that the mind could be special and different, the question for its possible relation to the brain, the mind-brain or mind-body problem, could not even be raised. It would just be nonsensical, would be a non-question. So, and you see this here, this is a paper which uh, came out last year of ours, and we reviewed all a lot of theories of consciousness in current neuroscience, which when you go into that field, it's a mess. And what we did here is, uh, so here you, you see the different theories of consciousness, here you see different features. And what we did here is see the coloring is the degree to which they assume uh, 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 late uh, post-stimulus activity, uh, early stimulus activity, uh, pre-stimulus and spontaneous activity, so different forms of neuronal activity, how they involve them. And most of them really still have this, there's something special, either in the stimulus activity, in the pre-stimulus, or in the resting state, which distinguishes the conscious from the non-conscious. However, and you see the title of the paper, there's a potential convergence inside where we say maybe brain and consciousness share something. 
And you will see uh, here embedding. And then, of course, you're uh, confronted with the question how to integrate and embed the special neuronal mechanisms of consciousness with to the non-special. So they're always, and that, of course, conceptually, leaves you by default with a gap. So um, that's the typical view. However, my claim is maybe they share something. And that's what they share, a similarity between non-consciousness and consciousness or between these different levels. So meaning maybe there's a similarity between the neuron and the mental, between the brain and the mind. So you see this is at both an empirical hypothesis about neuromental relationship, as well as ultimately an ontological hypothesis about the brain and mind. Yeah, uh, I will devote a lot of energy to the uh, empirical side of things to show you the conceptual framework of the empirical side of things and the ontological thing I leave a little bit out, but you can see this uh, in the book you mentioned, the neurophilosophy and the healthy mind, and particularly in the 2018, the spontaneous brain, from the mind body to the world, brain problem in MIT. So the idea is here, maybe we need to approach the mind in terms of non specialness And that's basically, and that of course leads you to the question of maybe there's, they share something. And that's what I call common currency. This is what they share, it's like a, you and I share the same language slash English. If they were not English, we could not communicate with each other because you would not understand my German and I would not understand your Hindi or your, your various other languages you guys usually speak at the same time. Yeah. So, um, so we share something and that similarity is central for our communication, for our transforming of ideas, conveying of ideas. Same in the brain, there's a common similarity, a common currency between the neuronal mental, and that's central for transforming neuronal into mental activity. So, and what is this common currency? Basically, my talk will just revolve around that. And that's what I say, it's a temporal spatial dynamics. What do I mean by dynamics? Dynamics, you know this very well in the Indian tradition. It's about change. We change from A to B. And that difference between A to B is the change. It is not that we first look at A and then at B and just see, okay, uh, now we add them up. No. So and then here's a very beautiful quote of, uh, by Nikola Tesla. Uh, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, uh, frequency, and vibration. So and that's basically the the starting point for this paper, which we published last year in Physics of uh, Life Reviews, where we really introduced the quest of common currency. And that, of course, leads you to a different kind of neuroscience that meaning you conceive con uh, phenomenal features like consciousness, cognitive, in terms of their spatial temporal dynamics. And that's what I mean by spatial temporal neuroscience. And I will show you some of those examples. And that has major implications, obviously, also for how to approach these things for psychiatry and for philosophy. So, what is the common currency of brain and mind, time and space? And that's important. The distinction for you, it's not difficult to understand. When I speak of time and space, I, don't, I do not mean how time and space are perceived. I mean how time and space are constructed. Not how we perceive distinct points in time and space, but how they are constructed, how they're related to each other. This is what I try to indicate here. So you have a brain, and the brain that is important, it constructs its own inner time and space. Just like you see a river flowing, or the waves of the uh, seaside, they construct a certain time and space. That's exactly what the brain does too. So it's not the way we perceive or cognize that time and space. That is often confused, particularly in the Western tradition, because they don't make this difference. They see everything, time and space, is as we perceive in cognitive time and space. So you see here is a pattern. There's a certain structure. And that you see a time series is a time series 
let's say, what you get as a raw data and imaging fMRI or EEG. That's basically what you're dealing with. You, you, you deal with this one. You deal with time series. And you look, there's, there's nothing in there. There's a lot in there. There's a certain structure in there. And that structure of that time series, that's what I'm keen on. Yeah. For instance, you have different uh, fluctuations in different uh, frequencies. Uh, here, infraslow, 0.01 hertz, 100 seconds to tens uh, hertz. Uh, and so on and so on. You see this typical uh, gamma, beta, alpha, different bands in EEG, MEG, and, and fMRI. Yeah? And you will see much of my talk is basically trying to get a structure out of this. Uh, see here, I bring you the example of the seaside. Um, uh, you have a lot of slow, uh, some slow waves, very powerful, you're afraid that they smash you towards the beach. And then you have a a lot of fast waves, but they're much less powerful. So there's a structure, the slower waves, more powerful, uh, faster waves, less powerful. Exactly the same in the brain. Um, and then you can have a certain structure. And here, I just show you one typical example, which I will often come. So the structure, you have a power spectrum. So this is the frequency, fast, slow, uh, power, uh, not much power, a lot of power. And you see there is more power in the slower frequencies than in the faster. And if you do a double uh, lock of this, uh, you get basically a typical the typical shape of the power spectrum. And the shape, like this one, that's what is described as power law distribution. The power law exponent ba basically measures the structure of your power spectrum. And you will see in my data that this structure of the power spectrum is highly relevant because it predicts your degree of self-consciousness and other mental features. Then you have other features like autocorrelation, you know, how much distinct time points in your time series correlates with each other. Temple autocorrelation is called autocorrelation window. Also, the different frequencies are coupled with each other. And there are many more measures which we are currently exploring. So, uh, that's basically the idea. I will show you several examples of this common currency, spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, uh, basically, if you want to say so, neural waves uh, translate into mental waves. It's a brain mental surfing. I think I have an example here. Like free will, they're basically uh, surfers on the brain waves. And the better you, the better you align to the waves, the better you can surf. Same with the mental, the more coherent the structure, uh, the better the mental features. So, I hope I gave you an idea. That's sort of the philosophical background of my talk. Um, so that's within its set. And now I give you the example of a self. I will try to keep that brief uh, to have more time focused on the main topics, the environment of the brain. And then I will wrap it up. So, when we talk about ourselves, I know that in your tradition there's a long, long history of talking about self and what self means. Uh, in the Western world, self has often been associated with being self aware, self reflection. I am aware that I'm giving the talk. I see myself here in the little Google picture that it is me. Yeah, so here I see myself in the mirror. Yeah, and this is me. And there are conditions as a psychiatrist. However, as you will see, I will try to point out a deeper level of self. A deeper of le level of self which goes prior to your awareness and cognition and reflection. And even a deeper level of self which connects you to the social cultural environment. So it's really a much deeper layer of self to which you usually don't have a conscious access. Yeah? And it is these deeper layers which can be very, can change. So as a psychiatrist, I saw all kinds of interesting selves. I saw Jesus, Buddha, Nofretete, Mao, and other famous people. Now you think, oh my gosh, this guy is completely crazy. Uh, yes, it is crazy. Because these people really have the belief they are these people. Interestingly, there's a strong culture component to it. So Jesus, you probably won't meet in India, but I assume you meet a lot of Buddhas in the psychiatric hospital. In China, I met a couple of Maos. 
uh, and in Egypt I once encountered Nofretit. So there's a cultural dependence which kind of identity people assume in their psychosis of schizophrenia. So indeed this is very interesting and actually there's also a logic to it. Once I remember that back in Germany I had uh, two patients in the ward, in the same ward, who both claimed to be Jesus. So that's strange. So at first I went to the one guy and said, yeah, and you know, and Jesus and blah, 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 and you know the history of Jesus. Yes, of course, and there's only one. And he was also dressed like Jesus, with a beard, with a white robe, and, and pretended to be. And then I asked him, yeah, but how is it possible that there are two Jesus? There's another one here on the ward who claims to be Jesus. And I said, who is the real Jesus? He said, it's me. The other one is wrong. And then I asked the same to the other patient, and she said exactly the same, the other one is wrong. So there's a deep certainty that they really believe it. So how is that possible? So there has been a lot of research in neuroscience since 20 years, since 20 years about the self. Um, and you can test the self, for instance, you present the own name versus another person's name, you present the own face and things like that. And that has yielded activity, interestingly, in particular, the uh, a set of regions in the midline regions of the brain. Basically, when you have your brain in the middle and you see the what is called the cortical midline structures. So, and then interestingly, and that was usually done when you get these stimuli. However, and that was really interesting for me, even when your brain is not doing anything, meaning you're in the resting state, so your brain is still very active, but you don't have any specific cognitive or mental task. So you don't see yourself. You don't see your own face or name. And your activity level in these regions is still the same, even in the resting state. So this is what we coined. So this was for us a big surprise that we saw the same activity level in the resting state, as well as when you see self-specific activity. In contrast, when you have stimuli not related to yourself, non-self-specific activity, there's the activity changes. So only uh, your self-specific activity is similar to the resting state. So that was a big surprise. Because in the Western tradition, you say that the self is the most higher order cognitive, most difficult task. So then you would expect that the self-specific activity really differs from the resting state. However, the opposite was the case. So for me, as a philosopher who conceives the self as intrinsically subjective, was that the hint to say maybe our brain's intrinsic uh, spontaneous activity and in general is intrinsically subjective? So that was a major, major step for me. We published this paper in 2011. And since then, I reversed my whole research project, uh, approach because of this finding. Because if the brain is intrinsically subjective, I need to find something which corresponds to that. And that's what I hope I can find in the special temporal dynamics. So then the question arises, what kind of feature in the brain's resting state encodes the self. Yeah? So, because there's no specific form of cognition going on. So then I say, maybe that is some of the spatial temporal dynamics. And you remember the scale free activity with the power spectrum. You can see this here. So, this is an fMRI study, 2016. Um, and you see here the frequency. And this is a frequency range of fMRI from 0.01 hertz to 0.1 hertz, so this is 100 seconds to 10 seconds. So these are slow waves. They're called infraslow frequencies. And then you have the power. So here you see in the very slow frequency range, you have a lot of power. In the faster, you have much less power. The typical, that's a dynamic thing, has nothing to do with the brain. That's what you see in the world when you see seismic earth waves, when you see storm, when you see sea waves, they all follow such a distribution. It's a loss of nature. And the brain, after all, 
is an organ of nature. There is nothing special to the brain. I'm sorry to rob you of all your illusions. The brain is an organ of nature and functions to the same dynamic principles. And we plotted that here, particularly in the midline regions. And one thing which you already see, so each of these lines is one subject, you see quite a lot of differences between the different subjects. These are inter-individual differences. So your power spectrum in this cortical midline structure, medial prefrontal cortex, will be different than mine. Why? Because there's a different genetics, but also a different cultural shaping, which I show you in later slides. And you also see a difference between the two regions is the posterior cingulate cortex, medial prefrontal cortex. You see that shape slightly different from here. So you can differentiate between individuals and between regions by using this power spectrum less scale free dynamics as measured by Paolo experiment. And interestingly, we had the same subject. So this was just resting state. Uh, the same subject also performing. Uh, scale, which uh, the self-consciousness scale. Yeah, because of course it's resting state, you cannot do any tasks, so you can do this only outside the scanner. So and that's what we did here. Um, so you see the, the scale includes three different dimensions, uh, private, public, social, and you see they particularly correlate with the private self-consciousness. And importantly, the, the more power you have in the slow frequencies here, the higher your power law exponent and the more your self-consciousness. Meaning, your self-consciousness may be driven by the uh, relative balance of slow waves to fast waves. When you just correlate to slow waves alone, it won't correlate anymore. So it's really the balance, the structure. So then we did the same in EEG. These are different subjects. The same in EEG. Why? Because EEG has a faster frequency range. You see this here, 1 to 70 hertz, than fMR. And we saw exactly the same. So meaning this holds across all different frequency bands, fast and slow. So what your sense of self is the relative relation between slower and faster frequencies. Yeah? So it's really the structure of your power spectrum. And here we also included uh, some other measures, remember the earlier slides, uh, we had the power law exponent, this is basically how different frequencies are nested within each other. It's like, like the Russian dolls and uh, Anne-Marie Wolf, the first author, she's a postdoc in my, in my group, she did this very nice slide and she did the whole investigation. You see it's really a nestedness, a smaller time scale is nested within a, a, a slower uh, time scale. Yeah, uh, faster time scale nested. You see this when you go to the seaside. You see a one big wave, and then you see a lot of small waves being nested within the big waves. Literally, it's a temple nestedness. Then you can measure the autocorrelation window, the correlation between the different time points. It's for temporal continuity of cells. And then, of course, how the different frequencies are coupled. And all these measures, these three temple measures of temple structure, all correlate with your self consciousness. So there's an intrinsic temporal and also spatial dynamics to the self. And important, I don't want to go into detail, but just indicate this uh, temporal dynamics is highly relevant for your changes in self. So we showed in this paper last year that uh, the uh, power law exponent and also the autocorrelation are abnormal in schizophrenia, particularly during self and also in autism. So our hope is that we can use some of these dynamic measures also to make a differential diagnosis, which we have no diagnostic markers of. And that ultimately we can also have ways to manipulate them, for instance, by music therapy or transcranial magnetic stimulation. So this is all work in progress in the pipeline. So um, this is another example. I, I don't want to go so much in detail because I want to focus more on the ecological, but here just uh, tell you how you can link that more to the even more to the psychological level. So this is a, uh, a study which was done by a, a Dutch student who came for half a year, who is now back in, in Amsterdam in Holland, also in lockdown, as he just told me yesterday. So here is a paradigm, it's a well-known paradigm. You have to match uh, shapes like a triangle with either your name. Uh, or with another person's name, 
and you have to link them. This is a famous paradigm by Zui. She introduced that. And we introduced a temple delay. Yeah, so we had a temple delay between the shape and the name. And we wanted to see how much uh, that temple delay impacts your attribution, your association of the shape with the name. And usually you have faster reaction time, higher reaction time, if you associate this shape with yourself. That's a self-bias. Really, you, you will see our bias, our self-bias is enormous. Or you see this also in daily life, how you perceive things. Perceive things which are uh, more related to you, you perceive faster and more accurate. Same here, if you associate this uh, shape with yourself, rather than with another person's name, you have more accuracy and more faster reaction time. And we inserted a temporal delay and wanted to see how much is the self-bias preserved over the temporal delay. So that's temporal continuity. And interestingly, you see this here, the accuracy is preserved. It's 720 milliseconds, 700 milliseconds, which is a lot, yeah? You still see the self-bias uh, preserved. This is a non set yeah? And then we also looked whether the resting state, again, just the resting state of these people, uh, completely independent of this paradigm, predicted this temple, this uh, preservation of the self-bias across temporal delay, meaning the slope of this curve. And that's exactly what we saw. Again, uh, the higher your power law exponent, the longer your autocorrelation window, uh, the better your self-bias was preserved. So that really tells us that maybe the temporal delays are uh, um, uh, operationalized by the scale-free activity on the neuronal activity, on the neuronal level, correlate with the temporal delays on the psychological level, meaning this guy here, the self-bias over time delays. Yeah. So that really says maybe this temporal structure, scale-free activity, across different frequency, multi-scale, uh, how much they nested with each other, share is a similarity between the neuronal and psychological level. Literally a common currency. And that's, now we have various paradigms and studies running where we analyze the same measures, power law exponent, on the behavior level of a time series and on the neuronal level. So that's the next step that you want to see. Maybe my power law exponent is not only manifested on the neuronal level, but in analogous way on the psychological level. And that's not an easy one, because then on the psychological level, you really need to have a created time series of your psychological data, and you need at least two, 300 data points. So that's not an easy one, but we're doing that. And indeed, the data which we see, this pilot data, points strongly in that direction that your P, uh, power law exponent on the neuronal level is similar, analogously manifest on the psychological level. And ultimately on your consciousness. You would like to have the fluctuations in, for instance, your time consciousness or the contents of your consciousness being related to the uh, fluctuations in the, uh, in the brain. So you see, this is really what I like to call uh, a spatial temporal neuroscience. Let me just uh, give you this example. You probably all know this. This is uh, Leonardo da Vinci Last Supper, beautiful painting in Milano. So this is a painting. And what does he do? What does he do? I, I'm a big fan of Leonardo uh, da Vinci. Why? Because look at this. This is a 2D canvas, but it looks like it's a 3D canvas, as if they are in the room. So there's a spatial topography to it, out of a 2D. So he virtually creates that. So then look at these guys. These are all the apostles. And of course, you know, one of them will betray Jesus. Jesus in the middle of the Last Supper. One of them will betray. You have the feeling it's just a time shot. If you look one millisecond later, there will be different gestures. So he presents them in an animated, natural, dynamic way. Yeah? And this is all virtual. It's just a painting. That's what your brain does. It creates a virtual 3D dynamics. Yeah? A 3D spatial temporal structure. And that is manifest in our mental features. So we now investigate mental features with respect to time and space. Cognitive paradigms like what I just saw. It's a cognitive paradigm. We insert a temporal delay. Yeah? And of course, you could do the same spatially. Yeah? So that's what I mean by spatial temporal neuroscience. Uh, there's a commentary 
uh, to the vapor. So important. <clears throat> this is classical. <clears throat> Uh, this is classical, <coughs> excuse me, social neuroscience centimeter. And they look for specific content, input output relationship, content. So you have this content, that content, another content. So you distinguish according to content. Yeah. And it's very uh, based on processing of information. Yeah. So, however, I argue there's a deeper level to this is just a brain function underlying there's a brain dynamic. And that brain dynamics drives and constitutes the function. For instance, I uh, cannot present you this now. Uh, uh, I don't, do you see it? No, yeah, uh, I leave it. So let's say you imagine you have different window sizes. Yeah. And these different window sizes allow you to perceive different contents. If you have a big window size, you see the whole panorama. If you have a small window size, you just see the tree in front of you. And that's exactly so meaning the size of your windows of the house determine what the kind of content you can see outside. Same here, the kind of spatial and temporal structure we have in the brain shapes the kind of contents we can see or not see. So meaning your spatial temporal dynamics is sort of sets the framework for the kind of contents we can have in these different disciplines. Brain dynamics drives brain function. That's what I mean by special temporal neuroscience. So when you present me, <clears throat> let's say, with a certain task or paradigm, I will look a little bit at the content and then I will immediately tell you what is the temple, ask you what is the temporal structure of your uh, paradigm. Is it slow? Is there a long inter trial interval? How long is the stimulus presented? All that kind of stuff I want to know. Yeah. And what is the spatial of that paradigm? So I deconstruct your paradigm in spatial terms, and then I analyze the brain activity uh, see in corresponding spatial temporal measures. And ideally, I will try to create a time series of your paradigm and look for power law exponent on the psychological behavior level. So important what spatial temporal neuroscience is goes for, instead of input-output relationship, it goes for spatial temporal between different time points, change, entropy, complexity, all these kind of measures which we have. It goes for organization and structure rather than content. And it is for how can we integrate different time and space scale, a smaller spatial scale, a fast time scale with a slower one. So it's all about this integration of these different time and space scales. So it's multi-scale, across scale, by default, whereas usually we just operate within one frequency range. And I say that these kind of relationships are key for mental features, for your experience of the mental features, the subjective component, and the kind of content you can perceive. So, and here, this is the consciousness paper, which I mentioned uh, above. Uh, it's really a deeper neurodynamic level, which is provided by the spontaneous activity. So you have the, continue, the cognitive level here, and here's your dynamic level. Yeah, and here, I think here again, uh, unfolded, and this is basically the different levels of neuronal activity, spontaneous, pre-stim, early, uh, post-stim, late post-stim, and you see associated with different uh, levels of consciousness, non-conscious, unconscious, and so on and so on. Yeah, so <clears throat> now, so now I'm finally there where I should have been at the very beginning, but I think that gives you a little bit of background. Now I, I extend. So, so far I said, okay, there's a common currency between brain and mind, a shared similarity. Now, not of course completely crazy and says, no, I go even one step further. Maybe there's also something shared between the environment and the brain. And that, again, is the spatial temporal dynamic. Because, remember my uh, Tesla quote, if you want to understand uh, nature, you need to look into the energy frequency and fluctuation. Same here. So this is what brain environment share. We haven't elaborated that in papers yet, the common currency approach to the ecological level. But that's what I show you some example. Uh, it's a key in connecting to the brain, to the environment. Why? For instance, uh, when you listen to music, the beautiful music in India, you have rhythm. And the rhythm of your brain synchronizes with the rhythm of the environment. And that is an alignment. 
when your brain starts to impose its own rhythm about uh, uh, upon the external music, you will not synchronize, you will not feel the groove, you're not in the flow. You're not part of the music. So that's why I speak of word brain alignment. The brain is part aligned to the world as a whole. It's embedding itself in an active way. It's nesting itself in an active way within the spatial temporal structure of the environment through its own structure. Prototypical example, I will not go into that, of that is, for instance, meditation. And I say this explicitly because, of course, your country is the country of meditation with the tradition. Yeah? So, uh, so the brain is in, and if that is lost, that the capacity to align to the environmental context is lost, you lose your consciousness. Yeah, so we have, I think I don't mention it here, we just last year in December or this year in January, we published a paper on input versus output processing that these time scales are key and that the input processing is key for consciousness, not the output processing. So here I present you a very nice paper which. Uh, one of my Italian postdocs, uh, Andrea Scalabrini, did. So he was interested and he did a very interesting paradigm. So he said, OK, uh, we're in the scanner and we're letting the people touch an animate hand, a real hand, a real hand like this one, uh, and an artificial machine hand. That's what he called animate touch. And we wanted to see whether your spontaneous activity is really subjective and self-specific. Then you would expect it predicts much better the animate versus the inanimate. So, and what he did, he did a very clever thing. He did a, a combined a behavior study and uh, FMI study. And the first thing what he did, uh, so he just investigated purely behavior. So he let uh, subject touch uh, the real hand and the, uh, the, the robot hand. And then he asked afterwards the uh, subject for the degree of self-relatedness, whether the real hand or the uh, robot hand. And you saw with the animate target, the real hand, sorry, they have a significantly higher degree of self-relatedness. It's much more closer to me a real hand than a robot hand. Huge, so the AI people have to really think. Then the perception of time. So here we ask the subject, how much you feel in synchrony with the hand. And you see much more synchrony uh, with the real hand than the animator. So it's a pure, pure perception experience of time, space, how close you feel to the hand. And you see, again, these were a hundred Italian subjects, uh, you see much closer to the real hand to the, than to the inanimate time. Yeah? So your perception of time and space is highly related to your ecological context, whether it's real or non-real hand. Then, he did the same experiment in FMI, and he first constructed animate versus inanimate targets, just a typical uh, amplitude magnitude uh, task state, and he saw that here animate yields more activity than the inanimate. That was expected because this is like self, this is like non-self. And then he investigated, then he went to the resting state, investigated the scale-free activity, that's a power spectrum. And here you see the different lines of the power spectrum again, and he could see that uh, the degree of your power spectrum predicts your animate, inanimate, task evoked distinction. Meaning, the higher your power law exponent, the more power you have in slow frequencies relative to the faster ones, the higher your distinction between animate, inanimate targets. So meaning your scale-free activity, the structure of your power spectrum in the brain, predicts, helps you in distinguishing animate, inanimate targets in the environment. And the better you have the slow frequencies relative to the faster, the better you can distinguish that. So that goes very well with the self data. So that's one example how these uh, the brain's spatial temporal dynamic of its resting state. In resting state, we're not talking about task evoked activity. It helps you in distinguishing as related to the environmental context. 
Uh, another example, which is particularly relevant for me as a psychiatrist, this is an earlier study, 2015, by Neil Duncan, who is now in Taiwan, he's a professor there. Um, so here we investigated early childhood traumatic experiences. Yeah, like, uh, and there's a particular scale for it called the uh, Childhood Traumatic Experience uh, CTQ uh, questionnaire. And we correlated that with the resting state in the same cell. Pure resting state, and we measured the entropy. You can see this here. Oops, where's my cursor? Here on the right, ventromedial prefrontal cortex here on the right. And you can see the more early traumatic life experience you had, the more, the higher your degree of entropy. So here we measured entropy, which is basically the, the degree of order or disorder or predictability of your states. Meaning the more early traumatic life experience you have, the more disordered is your neuronal activity 20, 30 years later. Yeah. So this is amazing. So meaning this tells you that your environmental context leaves a mark a trace in the spatial temporal structure of your spontaneous brain activity. So it is here in the brain, yes, but it's highly sensitive and adaptive to the environmental context. Yeah. So it's conceptually speaking, it's not just neuronal, it is neuroecological. Spontaneous activity is neuroecological. Task evoked activity is neurocognitive. Yeah, and both have to work together. If they don't work together, bad news for your consciousness and your mental features. So here I show you now, this is probably very interesting for you, the cultural aspect of six. So we have a line of research where we looked for cultural differences. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu, you probably know him from anthropology, uh, structures which generate and organize practices and representation and systems of durable, transposable, dispositions. So here, I think we can really uh, provide some flesh to the bones, what he means. So there is well known that the self, the sense of self in psychology, which goes back to Marcus Kitayama, there's a sort of, you can define yourself in a more independent, individual way. Here on the left, so your tendency to keep yourself unique, lower similarity, with others, you need to be different from all others. And typical, you see this in the Western culture, particularly in the Anglo-American world. You are individual, you are special, you're different, and the whole education system is really geared towards just making you different and you're unique and, and, and all that. So even as a German having moved to Canada can see even there is a difference, yeah? Then, if you go more towards the east, and you know this from your part of the world, and particularly when you, you go further, even further east in China and in Japan, uh, Korea, there's more sort of you define yourself through the relationship to the other, like to your mother, yeah, to your father. So that's more an interdependence. Uh, of course, this is not exclusive, it's a balance, yeah. But you really see this, and there's a lot of investigations, psychological as well as neuronal, which really showed that. Here we used a different approach. We wanted to say, so maybe if you're more inter, uh, in, and a, uh, if you're more independent, your ratings of self-consciousness should differ more from the other. If you're more interdependent, your ratings of self-consciousness should be more similar to each other. Yeah, because you share more, and that degree of more sharing should be reflected in an increased similarity in your psychological scores. And now you think we're completely getting crazy, also in increased similarity between the brains. So this is a paper we just uh, uh, submitted. So meaning here there's less sharing between subject and psychological neuronal measures. Here we assume there may be more sharing between uh, subject and psychological neuronal levels. So, and we had different uh, measures for that. So you can measure that uh, here, you see the intersubjective approach. So this is each subject. Then uh, uh, for each subject, uh, this is one group, this is another group. And then we can basically correlate the subject with each other. So here, we, this is a correlation matrix. Each of these uh, time points is a subject and we correlate the subject in their respective measures with each other. And then we can do this for another group. So this could be the Eastern group, this could be the Western group, 
than you see. And the same for neuronal measures of the brain. And you can measure the similarity between subjects or difference between subjects by measures like coefficient of variation, which is basically the, like the normalized <coughs> standard deviation between subjects, or you make an intersubject uh, to correlation. So, or you can measure the Euclidean distances, that's what we did here, between the scale values. So here we did this, here we applied the self-consciousness scale, remember we had that before, which correlates with the uh, power law exponent. And here, this is the Canadian, these are two Canadian samples and these are two Chinese samples. Um, <clears throat> the more green, the more distances between the scales. So these are for each subject, the self-consciousness scale, and we correlate the self-consciousness scale values between the different subjects and look here for the Euclidean distances in the scopes. And you can see that in the Canadian uh, sample, the distances between the subject scores are much higher. It's much more yellow. Whereas the distances between the psychological scores is much less in the two Chinese examples. We also did an Italian group with the same uh, thing, and they were more like the Canadians. And here you see the quantification of the Euclidean distance. So how much different is my self-consciousness score from your self-consciousness score? Yeah? And you can see that significant difference. And here we did the same for public, public social. It didn't really make a difference. Uh, it was in all uh, um, subscores. Uh, we also confirmed this is with the reverse, measuring how similar they are, intersubject correlation. And same thing, the Chinese were more similar on the psychological level than the uh, uh, Canadian. So it would be interesting to do similar things in India or other parts of the world. Um, then you say, yeah, where is the psychological similarity coming from between people? Maybe it's related also to more similarity in the brain. So now we investigated different dynamic features in the brain and saw how similar or dissimilar they are between subjects. So here we calculated the intersubject correlation. Uh, so we correlated each subject with each other, and here the intersubject distance, uh, the opposite. So, and you can see this is an EEG trace, it's a power spectrum, and you see for experts, of course, you know this is already the, the alpha peak, this is the alpha peak. So, and you can already see this in the alpha peak here. Uh, that look, the alpha peak is very different between the, each line is one subject. Yeah. Uh, that the alpha peak is very different between subjects. You can see that here. Because the alpha peak here is similar, it's at the same point of the power spectrum in the Chinese. So their power spectrum is more similar to each other in China than among the Canadians. Yeah. So even that similarity is higher among the Chinese than among the brain. Here, just in the power spectrum, you can measure that high intersubjective correlation. You see it's much more yellow here than here. You see the significant difference, intersubject distance, the, the difference, the much more, uh, uh, a less difference between subject distance in the Chinese than in the Canadian. Uh, next one. Uh, then we looked also for theta power. So theta power is here, here, and you see again, significant difference. Theta power, so the uh, Chinese were much, <clears throat> much more similar among each other than the Canadian. And that is highly relevant. Why? Because we know that theta is related to memories. So if the power is more similar, the theta power, the configuration of the theta power, then maybe assume that the internal mental contents, as for memory, might be more similar more shared memory contents, yeah? So you see, culture can deeply permeate your brain, yeah? Then alpha, so alpha peak frequency, you see, I discussed the alpha, look, these are the uh, Canadians, very different, these are the Chinese, uh, <clears throat> they're more similar, here you see the difference, alpha peak frequency, uh, <clears throat> much more similar among the Chinese, than among the Canadians. Yeah, and that is relevant because your alpha peak frequency, we know it's related 
to external cognitive load. Meaning, this higher similarity in the alpha peak frequency, and this is pure resting state, by the way, yeah, might indicate that they process external contents in a more similar way. As I said, your temporal dynamics opens a window to the kind of contents, remember my comparison with the windows, to the kind of content you perceive and not perceive. Um, yeah, so in general, so what does this mean? And we did the same for the power law exponent, and again, more similar. So meaning your temporal spatial dynamics seems to be located here in the brain, you see in the middle. However, uh, there's a similarity uh, between the brain's inside and the outside, slash here, the culture. Now what we're doing, now we are trying to present music uh, stories, and we analyze these external stimuli with our dynamic measures, like the power spectrum of your music or of your movie, and then try to link that time series with the degree to which it matched with the same measures Paolo exponent in your brain's spontaneous activity. And the assumption, of course, the better they match, the more likely that you have experienced feeling mental features. So I think it's a beautiful example of how structures, what Pierre Bourdieu said more in a sociological cultural context, structures which generate organized practices, temporal spatial structures and representations of culture or durable transposal dispositions, your spontaneous uh, uh, activities structure. So this is a very short thing. I just uh, want to make that. And these cultural differences for me, they're also present in the way the COVID is handled. So I am in Canada, I'm originally from Germany, and I have students from all over the world, and I Zoom every day through the globe, which is quite funny, sitting here in my little office at home. And so I get to see how people perceive the COVID. And it is really different. So in in the China world, in Taiwan, China, Japan, where I have a lot of contacts, they all perceive a deep intersubjective responsibility. I cannot affect the others, so I have to protect myself, not to infect the others. Because this is what we share. If the other is in a good condition, it's also good for me. So that's typical interdependent thinking. And I think it's really manifested in the way they deal with the COVID. And the uh, other, uh, I don't know enough about your context, how it is in your, here in Canada, and you know, in the West, you have all these demonstrations against lockdown. Uh, I have the freedom not to wear a mask. I have the freedom not to be vaccinated. However, that freedom is at the expense of the other. Because if I do not wear a mask uh, and I've got not, if I do not get vaccinated for the sake of my personal freedom, it infringes upon the other person's freedom because I might infect the other. Yeah. So there's a deep intersubjective existential, really existential dimension to it. And I would ultimately argue uh, this is requires a neuroecological slash neurosocial, neurosocial model of self and culture, yeah, and the brain, yeah. Uh, so this is really, and I think this deeper level here, the first stage which I try to indicate here, is often neglected in the Western world. This deeper neuroecological level that the brain is intrinsically part of the world, it synchronizes, it aligns its own rhythm, it picks up the structure of the environment. Yeah, the degree to which the scale-free structure of your environment can imprint itself upon your spontaneous activity. We saw it with the uh, animate versus inanimate. So I think that's a deeper neuroecological level. And that's hugely important for understanding our brain, for understanding neuromental relationships, for understanding psychotic disorders, because where this deeper level is abnormal. And thirdly, it has a deep implications for philosophy, because then you really need a relational, an ecological ontology, First, you need an ecological ontology. And second, you need a relational form of ontology, meaning 
uh, it's a relation to which brain and world are related with each other, which might be a necessary condition of possible mental states. That's what I call world brain relation. Of course, the concept of world also needs to be differentiated with ecological, like say Gibson affordances and things like that. Yeah, uh, come to the last slide, environment brain relation, very short wrapping up. Um, so I showed you several examples. It is really a nestedness. Yourself is nested within your brain spontaneous activity. And that in turn is nested within the temporal spatial dynamics of the world. What do all three share? Temporal spatial dynamics. So that's your common currency. And when I say temporal nestedness, nestedness, you're nested like the different Russian dolls with each other. Here is a Chinese crystal ball. Uh, you see a lot of uh, <clears throat> the same pattern. So this is much more fine-grained spatial nestedness, and I'm sure in your part of the world you have a lot of uh, beautiful examples of spatial and temporal nestedness too, which I'm not aware. And it's really a nestedness. So nestedness is both, both an empirical concept, which we can measure with Pawlowek's opponent scale-free activity, and at the same time is also an ontological uh, concept. So because it requires a temporal and spatial ontology. An ontology in existence and reality of how the world constructs time and space. And that is shared between world and brain. And that degree of sharing is a necessary condition, an ontological predisposition of the mental future. And that's what I mean by world and brain. So you see, it's an ontological and empirical approach at the same time. And important, you mentioned that in the introduction, it is non-reductive. There's no need for me to reduce now the, the mind to the brain. Yeah? Uh, there's no need. There's different context. Temporal spatial dynamics can be put in empirical context, ontological context. In each, it has slightly different meaning, but it's still related. Yeah? So that's a non-reductive neurophilosophy, as I would like to say, which I didn't go much here, but it's very important. But the key concept is really, it's a common currency, a shared similarity between them. And that makes us part of nature. And that's really like the same what uh, uh, Copernicus did. He uh, shifted the Earth from the center of the universe to the periphery. It, he made the, the Earth part of nature. Same Darwin. Darwin, Darwin made the humans part of nature by sowing, okay, it's a commonly shared evolution. Same here. I show that brain and world uh, share the temporal spatial dynamics just in different scales, and by that the brain becomes a part of nature, and by that we can understand mental features. Yeah? Um, so that's, I argue, in the MIT, the 2018 book, The Copernican Revolution. So here you see it's a, 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 a figure from a paper we're just about to submit. So you see really here the real time, real world behavior, the brain is part, and then you have explicate all these different dimensions. So these different dimensions, social, cognitive, affective, and here uh, culture, social, social, blah, 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 are abstractions from the underlying embeddedness of your brain slash self in the world. World, brain, world, self relationships. Yeah, so that's really an important thing, and it also uh, provides a spatial temporal underpinning to another concept, which is around free energy. Carl Fristen and I share a grant, and we work together on this. Uh, that what he calls free energy must be supplemented by temporal spatial dynamics, by the shared dynamics between environment and brain, in order to make the link to mental features. So meaning, underlying the free energy and the active inference of predictive coding, there's a deep temporal model. And that's what we're trying now, currently, to show. Uh, you see here, I indicated the common currency. And that makes it possible to understand why we have mental features, because mental features, as I indicated with the sub, have a deep temporal spatial underpinning, like your inner time consciousness fluctuates. It changes. It has a certain temporal structure. And that we assume is shared with the brain. Yeah, summary of my talk, main messages, uh, specialness versus non-specialness of mind relative to brain and body. 
traditional approach in Western world, specialness, uh, I say maybe there's non-specialness, there's a common currency, there's similarity. Second, temporal spatial dynamics provides the common currency. What do I mean by dynamics? Change. Not one time point, another time point adding or point in space adding, but the, the, the relative relation between them. Not the absolute power in the power spectrum, but the relative relation between slow and fast power. Uh, between slow and fast power. Yeah, and we literally can see this in our empirical data. That's what I mean by temporal spatial dynamics. What we need, we need a broader and more comprehensive spatial temporal neuroscience, which can complement, not contradict, complement cognitive neuroscience and affective neuroscience, putting it into a larger framework by pointing out this deeper spatial temporal layer, how it pre uh, predisposes cognition and affect. So, then I showed you environment and brain. There's a scale free nestedness, animate, inanimate, and your spontaneous activity is intrinsically ecological. I showed you the, the cultural differences. Uh, so there's a strong imprinting of your ecological environment upon your uh, spontaneous brain's activity, temporal spatial dynamics. And the assumption is that it is the temporal spatial dynamics, the stochastics of your environmental context, which provides a link to the brain. Then I mentioned the example of the um, COVID, the deeper ecological intersubjective level layer of ourself, which I think is paradigmatically illustrated by the COVID in East and West, uh, how this handled. And last not least, convergence with other models like the free energy of Frisson, and ultimately, what we're really trying to do is that can also be linked to artificial intelligence because you, the problem occurring in AI is artificial intelligence that the agents are not really adapted. But that's a talk uh, for another issue. I want to close with that. Uh, so uh, I hope I got, gave you an idea about maybe a slightly different unorthodox approach, but that, that might be very, very rewarding because you, you get a new view on traditional features and that changes your empirical data analysis, the kind of experiments you do, and also changes your concepts and your philosophical view. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor Nothoff. Um, there were so many, so many uh, questions that you kind of address, which is currently also being kind of being taken up within the social sciences, you know this whole entanglement of nature and culture that you spoke about and their relational ontologies approach, which also then helps address so many other things like race, for example, or gender, or, or, the, other th or, or the ways in which we imagine this thing called the world, right? Um, I, I, I mean, there's, there's so much, and I, and I think I have my question, but I would first want the audience to kind of respond to this. Um, so the, uh, the, the session is open for, uh, for questions. So um, I'm guessing people would need a few minutes to kind of process all of this that's been um, that's been discussed. So um, we are open to questions, comments. Uh, Professor Northup. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a question uh, for you. Uh, in your book, uh, The Spontaneous Brain, you have, uh, you have made a distinction between uh, uh, the spontaneous activity and the task-induced activity, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in that book, the overarching goal is to overthrow the uh, traditional mind-body problem because they want to replace that with the uh, mind and world problem, right? So uh, in that connection, I mean, uh, I, I just wonder um, how you would allow your view of the spontaneous activity to merge or align well with the, uh, with the extended cognition hypothesis in cognitive science because you have said in your book that uh, in the in the resting state of the brain 
uh, it is the brain that is uh, that is what uh, connects to the world through 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 uh, capturing the regularities of the world, including uh, including probabilities. So, how far would you be willing to allow that to? Uh, I mean, I mean, would you be willing to allow your own view to align well with uh, the extended cognition hypothesis in cognitive science, especially in the modded cognition uh, theory? Yeah, um, <clears throat> good question. Um, of course, there's a convergence. There's a convergence and divergence. There's a convergence that, of course, we agree it's not just the brain which is relevant for mental features. Yeah, clear. However, and that shares with embodied and the embodied and the foreigners. The divergence is that I start where the embedded people stop. So the embedded and embodiment still assume, um, okay, these are, let's say, for instance, the lift body. So the lift body is how you experience, perceive your own body, subjective body. And they take that for granted, <clears throat> link it with sensory motor functions, <clears throat> and say that embodied, and that in turn, through the body, you get to the environment that's your embeddedness. My direction is, twofold. First, I would argue that when you have your inter and exoceptive input from your own body, how it is integrated within the spontaneous brain's spatial temporal structure, that allows for the transforming of the objective body into the lift body. Something which the embodied approaches cannot really explain. They take the lift body, particularly in philosophy, as a given. Yeah, so I say, what is the necessary condition of transforming an objective body into the lift body? Yeah, and that's the necessary condition of possible embodiment. And for that, I say that your input of the body needs to be linked to some spatial temporal dynamical structure which allows for integration. In the case of humans, that's the brain. Yeah, so I would argue that I go deeper. I go deeper that and Second thing, that uh, integration of your brain's input into the spatial temporal structure of the brain also needs to be con converted with the extra set of input from the environment. Why? Because when you experience your lift body, you experience your lift body as part of a wider environmental context meaning your lift body is intrinsically ecological, meaning you need an integration uh, of your interceptive slash exoceptive bodily input or proprioceptive with the exoceptive input from the environment. And that is provided by the brain. Yeah, and how it integrates these different content. And that's why I speak of a word brain rather than word body relation. So for me, the word brain relation is a necessary condition of the possible lift body. Meaning at that relation, the spatial temporal dynamics is prior and basis predisposes the necessary condition of possible embodiment embeddedness. So it's not contradictory, but I would argue, I put it into a larger frame. It's chapter eight in the MIT book. Okay. Thank you so much. And one last point to that, I think it's highly important for building AI. Because there you need the adaptive capacity. So what I'm saying, uh, you need the mechanism how embodiment embeddedness come about. And I would argue that I may be able to provide. All right. Thank you for your answer, Professor Northup. You're welcome. Are there any more questions? I'm sure there are. 
Um, I have a question, uh, Professor Nautov. Uh, it was great listening to you, and uh, uh, I'm a first year PhD student. Now, um, you know, your insights on the neuroecological model is, you know, sort of explains a whole lot of uh, things, especially in the psychiatric disorders. Now, I'm wondering, I'm curious about, uh, particularly when we look at the sense of self and uh, the neuroecological approach, you know, in terms of explaining cluster B personality, you know, disorders, because um, you know, this sort of extends itself to, you know, describe more so of the cluster B. So I'm wondering how do we sort of, I mean, what are the ways in which we can integrate that in understanding cluster B and also in terms of the interventions, possible interventions that we can sort of look at from the neuroecological perspective? Yeah, good question. And you see, one of my inspirations is exactly the psychiatry, what I see. Yeah, it's not only cluster B, it's cluster A, it's other clusters. Um, um, and I agree completely. So for me, personality disorders, including cluster Bs, are changes in your neuroecological alignment. Yeah, and they can be subtle, like in more personality disorders, they can be major, like in uh, schizophrenia, psychosis, affective disorders. Yeah, um, and indeed many of the ideas which I try now sort of to exemplify in the healthy brain come from the psychiatric. Um, I give you an example, not in cluster B, but uh, more which I'm more familiar with and which we're actually working on in schizophrenia. So in schizophrenia, you know that um, you know that they cannot synchronize with the environment. So when you play music to a schizophrenic patient, you just stand there, cannot connect. The depressed patient is too slow. The schizophrenic patient cannot connect. So, and that can be related to, so they cannot face synchronize the rhythms of their brain to the rhythms of the environment slash the music. And you can measure that in the brain, which is called intertrial phase coherence. And now, now you can imagine, let's say, if you know more about this and we know more about the scale free structure and how all that is related, as uh, these Paolo exponent and the intertrial phase coherence, that we can maybe, for instance, provide music which trains the brain to better face synchronize. Yeah? So, of course, then you want to have an individual readout of your degree of face synchronization and what your face synchronization can do and not. And then you tailor the music accordingly. Yeah, ideally brain-based, individually based. Yeah. And you can also provide transcranial magnetic stimulation. Yeah. Or dance therapy. And that would probably also hold, particularly the letter to the music and the dance therapy, hold for uh, cluster B people. Yeah. Uh, because there the disturbance is not as major as, let's say, in schizophrenia. It's more subtle. Yeah. And my idea is really, and we're doing that, we're investigating these different psychiatric subjects, really trying to provide a readout of the spatial temporal dynamics, which should basically provide a readout of the mental capacities. Yeah. That's, of course, a very ambitious project uh, and we cannot of course do that but for certain diseases disorders we try doing that yeah <clears throat> and make so basically that we can read out from the spatial dynamics for instance remember i showed you the the self when you know that the slow frequency is very strong relative to the fast you might say yeah maybe you have a very strong sense of self and you might be more introvert yeah which actually is indeed true that would be a readout from the spatial temporal dynamics. Yeah? If you have too much slow frequencies, you might have a lot of inner thought going on. You have a lot of introspection. Uh, you constantly think about things, in particular about your own self, uh, whereas you're not so much external. Yeah? That's the kind of thing. And that's highly relevant for cluster B, for instance. But we are not there yet. So we are trying to find topographical, spatial, as well as dynamic features. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, 
Professor Nothoff, I have a question and I must um, admit that I am not from from discipline of um, linguistic or cognitive science. I'm an anthropologist. Um, but I mean, I, we, I mean, what you did mention about the environment of the brain and the brain being part of um, of the ecology of a natural ecology. I was wondering how does this kind of then uh, how are we then going to how does this reconfigure the philosophy or the philosophical kind of uh, discourses around what it means to be human? You know, the whole the whole question of human and post humanism. Um, in this, how uh, how does it get, how, how do you locate your work in that whole schema? Yeah, <clears throat> first I would probably not make a principle distinction because mm. ultimately we are part of nature. Yeah, uh, so meaning and there's even evidence we're just working on that that certain time scales in the brain are shared among different species. Yeah, so we have a certain repertoire of short and long, intermediate and short time scales. And that we share certain instances with other species, certain time scales. However, the humans might have also certain time scales more fine grained, which other species don't have. So meaning is just a difference in the degree, let's say, of time scales, how much let's say, coming back to the example of Russian dolls, how much different dolls you have inside. You might have only two when you open the big one, and you might have 30 inside. That's probably a difference. And that's the difference between different species. And that's also probably critical for AI. So how many time scales you build into the system? And I would argue the number of time scales and the range of time scales, how slow, how fast, that distinguishes the degree to which you have adaptive capacities to the environment. Meaning the degree to which you can adapt and match with corresponding time scales in the environment. Because obviously your environment has a much larger repertoire of time scales than the brain or your artificial agent. Give you an example. Uh, Thomas Nagel published 1974, the What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And the key feature of the bat is that, as you all know, it can process ultrasonar waves, which humans can't. So meaning the bat aligns to the environment in a slightly different temporal way than we do. Yeah. So meaning, because its window to the world is slightly different, its temporal window, ultrasonar, it perceives slightly different contents than us. So you see, ultimately, if you take an ecological point, there's no principal difference between different species. It's just a matter of degree of uh, time-space dynamics, as I would say. And that, of course, then also applies to the human posture. Yeah? Right, right. Okay. Are there any more questions? Uh, uh, Chandan, yes. I have in fact another question uh, for Professor Northrop since yes, yes, uh, yes. you raised the, the issue of uh, uh, the kind of feeling that uh, or, or the kind of experience that a bat might have in connection with the uh, uh, Nagel's paper. So how do you, Professor Northrop, how do you relate qualia to the spatiotemporal structure of the brain activities, the quality? Uh, <laughs> that's a key question. Um, yeah, again, I would deconstruct the dip. So it's not only qualia, as you know, it's intentionality, it's a stream of, of consciousness, temporal continuity, uh, transparency, ipsity, 
all these phenomenological features which have been well described in phenomenological philosophy. And I tell you, I would deconstruct the temple spatial. That's what I tried to do in my Unlocking the Brain, the volume two, 2014. Very daring and of course completely immature at the time. That's why I try to basically look at these phenomenal or phenomenological features, whatever you prefer from tradition you come. Uh, like well, yeah, like intentionality, like ipsity, like uh, temporal continuity, stream of consciousness, William James, sensible, sensible continuity. I would deconstruct them in terms of temporal spatial relations slash dynamics. Yeah. So that's why we are now trying to do. So I would argue that. Uh, when you speak about queria, you have a content, obviously, uh, like the screen in front of me, but that content must be embedded in a certain spatial temple structure. Yeah, and for instance, scale free, meaning the more that content, when I see here the P on my screen, which is your sign of the Google, uh, that must be embedded for me in a certain environmental context as on the screen and which also is related to certain spatial temporal context in my own brain. Meaning the better your P is integrated within other temporal and spatial scales within my brain, the more likely I will perceive it as a query. So I'm very serious about this. So let's say if you just present the P here without all the other uh, people on the screen, yeah, mm. I have a different context and that will impact the way my brain will process the P, yeah, because now it's within embedded all the others, so my brain has to recruit different temporal spatial scales, like the distance of your P to Chandan Bose, the distance of your P to Lily Marie. Alex, lower right. Yeah, so my brain now needs to recruit different time and space scale, and the more your P is embedded in a cross or multi scale way. Meaning, the more likely your P will be uh, related to my maybe uh, more distant uh, spatial scales as well as the slower uh, uh, temple scales. Mm. And that will make it more likely that your P will become conscious and have a quiet. Sorry that I deconstruct you in terms of spatial temple dynamics, but I hope that's the way I would do it. Now, ideally, you can test that. You can probe that. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I suppose uh, you would ex expect um, some amount of difference across individuals in the experiencing of qualia. Right. Because even if you and I see the same screen with right. the same spatial temple configuration, you see how I deconstructed the query in spatial temple terms and the content, because my spatial temple structure is different from yours. So meaning the same ex uh, environmental spatial temple structure of your P is matched with a slightly different spatial temple structure in you and my brain, meaning you will have different queries. Right. Of the same thing. So, so that entails that uh, no, no two qualia would be identical, right? Exactly. Individual differences. It's part of the mental. Yeah. So that also entail uh, that uh, no two qualia in the same person over a particular time scale would be identical in the same person. Exactly. You have a continuous change and that the way you change, that defines yourself. The self is not an entity. It's the pattern, the structure of the changes. That's yourself. Because I'm often asked, what is the self? And you know, there's a whole tradition in Western philosophy. Yourself is an entity. No, it's a continuous change. The pattern, the kind of pattern you change. Yeah? I think that would align very well with the kind of <clears throat> philosophy we have in India, because uh, we yeah. also... We also hypothesize that uh, self, the self is not actually, um, uh, I mean, a kind of uh, entity which is, uh, which is constant or something which is in, I mean, which is uh, always static. Right. So exactly that. So I would say 
that the brain and the self function according to the Eastern mode, not the Western mode. And I know that the Western people often say that you have a non-self. I would argue, no, it's not a non-self. Yes, there's no entity, but there's still a self. But this dynamic changing pattern self. You're right. Thank you so much for your uh, response. Um. I, we have, um, we, 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 we crossed the time, um, but maybe one more question if there is one, and then we can. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Northoff, for giving us the time and um, and speaking speaking to us today. It's been such such a pleasure hearing, and it's been such a um exercise to actually oh okay i think there's a question on the chat window how can i read this um i will i could read out for you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um you spoke about the bridging you spoke about bridging the gap between the brain and the mind i have a general question how far do you think the manner in which the medical treatments which target only a particular body organ are successful without considering the mind-body connection? To be honest, I mean, I know this is, you would like to hear this given your tradition and you see, I, I smile, you don't see this much through the Google now, but the mind is everywhere because your body is always connected. Your uh, stomach is connected to the to the brain and your stomach input sets a lot of input, the uh, slow frequency inputs to your brain spontaneous activity. So it's, it's integrated in there. And that integration of your input into different, of your stomach input with inputs of other scales, that gives you a mental dimension. And that's what I see as a clinician. I mean, I did uh, consultation liaison psychiatry. So I went as a psychiatrist to all the other medical disciplines and trust me, stomach pain, heart pain, there's always a psychological dimension to it. So the mental is, is always there because it's, it's, it's by default. Yeah, because you wouldn't feel your stomach sensation if that weren't there. That's a feeling, there's a stomach pain. Yeah, and you can have this can be more somatic, meaning real, or can be psychogenic when your brain goes, goes crazy. Your stomach is normal, but your input is, uh, stomach input is integrated in an abnormal spatial temporal structure, and then you get anxiety. Yeah, anxiety attacks for the heart, panic disorder. Yeah. So for me, I don't make it principal distinction between, I would ultimately amount that the distinction that the categories of mental and bodily uh, abstractions. But as you see, I'm extremely careful of avoiding the talk of a mind because in the Western tradition, it always implies an entity, which I want to avoid. So I talk of the mental, yeah? The mental features, yes, mental are always there and the distinction between mental and non-mental is artificial. It's an abstraction in our mind because of our limitation, yeah? But I think in reality, if let's say a brain would participate here in the Google and it would listen to us and say, what are they talking about? Brain, body, world. This is, I don't make a principal distinction between these three guys. Yeah. I hope that addresses the question in an unorthodox way, I'm aware, but that's what you see clinically. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, as much as you would like to keep on this discussion, um, I'm afraid we have to bring this to a close. Thank you so much, Dr. Northoff, uh, for your time. And um, this has been such a stimulating um, session that, I, I mean, we're going to definitely revisit the recording of this um, very soon. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. And um, we would love to have you physically once all these things get resolved. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to go. Yeah, yeah. sort themselves yeah. out. Uh, yeah. But thank you so much for for joining us today. Um, I hope we we haven't disturbed you much and have a good day for you. <laughs> you have the thank diet. you. 
Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. And by the way, can you send me once you have edited the talk that you can send it to me if you don't mind? I would put it no, on no. my website. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I can do that. Absolutely, we'll do that. Yeah, I would be very happy. For, and if certain questions are there, or if somebody is interested, she or he can contact me, and I would be very open to co-supervise students, whatever if people are interested. Absolutely. Uh, Prakash, are you saying something you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Professor Northa for taking a time for all of us and giving us this wonderful talk. And we are so <coughs> honored to have you today, to, yeah. have, a, to have, have had the opportunity to listen to you today. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well. Yeah. Stay safe. Have a good uh, dinner afternoon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> bye. Bye. bye bye thank you bye. thank you thank and you. thank you all for joining us thank you everybody thank you, thank you.